He blesses you, he blesses me, and we're blessed to be here today. So if you have your Bible, turn with me to the book of Galatians. The book of Galatians, and we're talking about harvest time for the entire month. We're going to be talking about harvest time. And God wants to produce a harvest in you. Amen. And so today we're going to talk about harvesting the fruit of the Spirit. Harvesting the fruit of the Spirit. Now... I want to begin today by simply saying that we are all works in progress. Yes, right. Amen. You see, when we became members of the body of Christ, when we became believers, uh, we God was not finished with us. Amen. That was just the beginning. Let's dispel the notion that if we could just make a person a Christian. That everything will be all right. No. Uh, that's good, but it's not the end. Um. As much as Jesus has done a great work in our lives, we have to understand that uh, the work is not complete. See, we didn't. God didn't just whisk us on up to heaven as soon as we came out of the baptistry. <laughs> no. Don't comment on that. <laughs> but the bottom line, we're here. Amen. And, and now God wants us uh, to bloom where we've been planted. Amen. 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 And so today, I want to impress upon us the importance of understanding that we who are believers, we've been set free. Yes. See, freedom is a powerful thing. Yes. yes. Freedom gives you uh, the uh, prerogatives to, to go and come as you please, right? Amen. You know, there was a long time ago when, when Moses had a, a, an audience with Pharaoh, and he said, uh, we want freedom. He said, let my people go. And it became very evident that there are mixed uh, and different connotations and, and different understandings of what freedom is all about. Right. If I were to ask you to define freedom, what would your definition be? If you were to give some kind of practical illustration of what freedom was, what would you say? See, because when they uh, were given their freedom, you know, the Bible said they, they left uh, Egypt and they uh, passed through the Red Sea. And then they begin to understand uh, in a practical way that freedom meant uh, the ability to flourish and grow. But it also meant the ability to starve to death. Uh -huh. Oh yes. Oh, yeah. They got to take their freedom and then after a while they didn't have anything to eat. Said, Let's go back to bondage. <laughs> Let's go back to Egypt. Let's go back to the familiar right. uh, persecution. Right. Uh, we, 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 we've tasted a little bit of this freedom, you see, because freedom brings with it privilege as well as responsibility. Amen. Oh, yes. Amen. Yeah, yeah, you say your amen until you can say it. 
But you know, sometimes we don't want to be responsible. You know, don't, don't tell me what to do. You know, don't get in my Kool-Aid. Don't get in my business. I want to have the, the full reign to live any kind of way. Well, um, the book of Galatians is what is called the Magna Carta of Christian freedom and liberty. It becomes the declaration of spiritual uh, independence, if you will. We have been set free in Christ Jesus. We have now experienced uh, the liberating effect of the blood of Jesus. No longer, no longer are we shackled and bound uh, by sin and death. No longer are we under uh, the, uh, the fearful and awful uh, fear of death. No longer uh, is Satan uh, manipulating us. No longer are we being done by the dictates of the flesh. Amen. We're free. We're free in Christ Amen. Jesus. Amen. And so today I want to produce, um, through by means of this lesson, produce Christians whose hearts are secure in their salvation. Amen. You see, I was in a Bible class one time and I, and I was talking to people and I said, you know, how many of us are saved? And I'm, I'm saying yes. That's why I feel don't go. And I said, if Jesus were to come back right now, <laughs> even before I complete this sentence, if he were to come back right now and shut this whole thing down, would you be willing and ready to meet him? Amen. Right. Yes. Folks, don't look around. <laughs> oh, but I hope I am. I didn't ask you that. You see, when we, if we are in Christ, we ought to have a confidence in our salvation. We ought to know who we are Amen. and whose we are. Amen. We ought to be confident in the fact that if, 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 if Jesus was to come back right now, I'm ready to meet him Amen. in the air. I'm ready to be with him. We sing about it. We talk about it. Right. But we live. Right, right, right. As though we are uncertain. Mm -hmm. right. mm -hmm. And I want today for us to have an assurance of our salvation. Why, Brother Mary? Well, why? So that we uh, don't find ourselves being tossed to and fro. Amen. That right. we don't find ourselves not only tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine, but tossed to and fro by the, the, the pool and the, the, the proclivities of the flesh. Yes. Sometimes we, we find ourselves in and out of the church. Uh, we find ourselves hot one day and then cold the next because we don't have a steadfast assurance uh -huh. of our salvation. Right. And therefore we can't give full throated commitment uh, to one who we believe sometimes. But not all the time. And so, uh, so that we don't have to engage in this uh, balancing act between the world and faithful service to Jesus Christ. We have to understand that our assurance of salvation must lead us uh, to growth. And assurance of our salvation must lead us to fruitfulness, Amen. to productivity. To spiritual higher walks, yes. uh, to a, a, a holiness. You see, God, Jesus, uh, Jesus secured our uh, justification right. on the cross. Right. If we look at the book of Galatians, we can say by this book, uh, justification, uh, as Roman, justification <clears throat> by faith. We've been justified by faith. Amen. It is the finished work of Jesus. On Calvary's cross that has secured our justification. Amen. We can stand before God as righteous and holy, not because of who I am, but because of who He is Amen. and what He's done for you. Amen. Yes, 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 bless the Lord. If, if, if it is through Jesus that we have now received justification uh, because of the finished work of, of Christ, it is also true that we now uh, move toward sanctification by the enduring and ongoing work of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If Jesus brought about our justification, then the Holy Spirit brings about our sanctification. Right. Hello. Right. And so therefore, I want to end this message, point to a theme of uh, the liberated lifestyle 
of the spirit field man. The liberated lifestyle of the spirit led man. The question is, uh, what spirit are you being led by? Hello? Are you being led by the dictates of the flesh? Or is the Holy Spirit uh, resting and ruling and navigating in your life? Amen. That becomes the question that you have to grapple with. Not only now, but as you go through your life journey. Amen. Notice, notice uh, this book. Uh, we want to see, we're in, in chapter 5. In chapter 5 and 6, we have what we call the, the practicum or the, the practical uh, application of this book. Notice back in chapter 1, uh, the Apostle Paul uh, is writing uh, to these individuals because uh, they had, uh, through his teaching, obeyed the gospel. That's a great thing, right? right? But as I said earlier, obeying the gospel is not the end. It's just a first step toward a greater, a greater end, which is to live a life that glorifies God. And so he had written to them because uh, they had obeyed the gospel. And they were doing quite well in their Christian journey until some of those uh, Christian Jews, we call them Judaizers, came down from Jerusalem. They came to the galactic region. And they begin to espouse uh, a different teaching. They were saying, yes, it's good. You, you have salvation uh, in Jesus Christ. But in addition to that, you have to add on a few things. You have to take on the law of Moses and, and live by the law of Moses as well. And a, a, a telltale sign of you living under the law of Moses was circumcision. That's what the apostle Paul came back and called them mutilated of the flesh. And so notice uh, in chapter 1, uh, he begins, he, he said, I marvel. I mar I'm amazed at the fact that you are so uh, easily removed uh, uh, to another gospel. He said this gospel is really not another, uh, but uh, someone has now perverted the gospel of Christ. Notice, just quickly, when he talks about uh, this other, another gospel, he didn't use, he used the word uh, heteron for another. Now you remember when, when, when Jesus uh, in, in John chapter 7 and 8, uh, more specifically 7, when he said, I'm going to send you another comforter. Amen. <laughs> another comforter. He used the word alloth. And that means another of the same kind. Jesus, I'm going back to the Father. But I'm going to send you someone like me. I'm going to see, I've been your comforter. But he said, I'm going to see another comforter. He used the word Elo, another comforter, another of the same kind. Ah, but in this text, when the Apostle Paul is talking to the Galatians, he said, you have been bewitched. He said, I marvel that you're so far removed to another, he used the word Tetra, uh, another of a different kind. There's a whole different kind of doctrine that you have now swallowed. And now that you have embraced this, you, have, you find yourself gradually moving away from Christ. You're moving closer toward uh, law keeping. You see, today we would call that legalism. So now we can become very legalistic. Right. And therefore we begin to, to, to layer on other print, 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 how do you say that? Quid pro quo. <laughs> and you got to do this, you got to do this, and you got to do this. And before you know, we have straight jacketed our sake. That's why he said you've been set free. You've been set free to be free. You've been set free to be free. Amen. Now live a life that is not straight jacketed by all these requirements of the law. All the requirements of traditionalism. Of legalism. Because if you're free, he set you free to be free. And so... And so, in this particular section, he begins to express how the fruit of the Spirit is going to manifest itself in the life of the believer. Let me give you just three quick statements 
And then we're going to kind of expound on those statements and then the lesson will be yours. I want to begin by saying, <clears throat> I want to highlight and point to the privilege and responsibility of Christian liberty. Right. Now, I'm going to take a liberty right now to, to move up to verse number 16. I know the, the passage was 22 through 26, but in order for 22 and 26 to have better meaning, we're going to go up uh, and start about verse number 16. Is that all right? Amen. Okay, notice, notice what we're, it's going to, we're going to go into a little teaching phase in this, so kind of uh, bear with me. Uh, notice when I said uh, the liberated lifestyle of the spirit-led man, in verse 1 of chapter 5, he says, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty or in the freedom Okay? Wherewith Christ has made us free. And be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Right. He said, don't go back and, and become entangled again in the very thing that you've just been made free from. Right. The privilege and responsibility of Christian liberty. You see, it was for freedom that Christ has set us free. So we have to keep standing firm and, and do not be subject again to the yoke of slavery. So notice, notice this is what I call a, what the Bible calls an imperative. He's given a command. He's not beating around the bush on this thing. He says, uh, see a command, he commands them to walk by the Spirit. So when we say walk by the Spirit, what on God's green earth does that mean? Does it mean that, you know, I'm just, I'm just so happy and, you know, I'm, I'm all in the spirit, I'm caught up. Does it mean that I get so full that I have to have ecstatic outbursts and nothing? <laughs> See, when we are commanded to walk by the spirit, it simply means, brothers and sisters, that we are to live and to walk by the spirit's teaching. That's right. right. That's right. That's true. The word of God gives us the, the, the Spirit's teaching. You see, the Bible says that, that, that uh, uh, God's Word is, is God breathed. God's Word is given to us from all high. And, and the apostles, they wrote, uh, and even the prophets wrote, as they were being moved or carried along by the Spirit of God. So the Spirit of God is the author of the Word of God. Amen. That's why on the day of Pentecost, the Spirit uh, came on the apostles. They began to proclaim the message. They could not proclaim it until they had been filled or, or, or uh, engulfed by the power and the influence of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So if you are to walk by the Spirit today, that means you are understanding your Bible. That means that you are not only reading it, but you are heeding the Word of God. Right. Amen. He says, walk by the Spirit. In other words, if we be led by the Spirit, we're not under the law. You see, if you love the Word of God, if you love God, Amen. if you were just so in love with Jesus, Amen. just like a newlywed couple, all in love, Amen. you know, yeah, yeah. you know, you can't go nowhere, yeah. you know, ride each other, yeah. you know, you, you go and you, you at a restaurant and you eating it, you know, <laughs> start cutting some off your plate. Yeah. Where my wife? <laughs> you know, you look up and you said, all in your plate, and he, all this honey. <laughs> Newly, newlywed. <laughs> you know, <they're> <laughs> but you see, you see, if you're so in love with God, then his commandments are not grievous. That's, 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 That's true, preacher. That's true. Does that make sense? Yes. If you love God, yes. and you were just so, you know, in love with Jesus, you know, Jesus, he's your everything, and, and you're all in all. Right. Well, when he says, do this, that, and the other, why you get locked y'all? Mm -hmm. And they're like, you don't want to hear that. Mm -hmm. If you, Jesus said, Jesus, Jesus Brother Mary was, didn't say this. I'm not plagiarizing because I'm giving him credit for what he said. Amen. Jesus, if you love me, keep my commandments. Amen. 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 That's what he said. That's right. And so therefore, uh, if you love him, uh, it's going to manifest itself 
And I owe allegiance to him. And I'm obedient to him. If you love me, keep my commandments. And it's not grievous, but it's a delight. The word of God is not the bondage of all keeping, but it is delightful direction. Amen. Amen. I like that. Yeah. It's delightful direction. Yeah. He, he, he helps us to steer us away. He leads us not into temptation. Amen. He delivers us from evil. His word is a lamp unto our feet and a light that illuminates our path. Amen. Amen. Instruction and righteousness well, yeah. comes from the word of God. Amen. Active spiritual life is a safeguard against lawless affections. Not only that, how does one live uh, by the Spirit? How does one live by the Spirit? Well, first of all, you have to believe the Spirit with you. Amen. Amen. Hello? Amen. You have to believe that the Spirit is with you. Yes. yes. He's with you. Yes. The Bible says that, you know, uh, we receive as virtue of our faith response to the gospel. We receive uh, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit as an earnest, as a pledge or a down payment to eternal life. Amen. We have to understand that the, that the Spirit of God rests and abides in us. Amen. That's why the Bible says, do not grieve the Spirit. Right. You can find yourself grieving the Spirit and not allowing the Holy Spirit to have its perfect work in your life. Right. So first of all, you, need to, you have to understand and believe that the Spirit is with you. But then secondly, we must yield our own desires to the Spirit's desires. Right. And Spirit is spiritual confrontation. When we're face to face with those options in life. Temptation. That's a good word. <laughs> Temptation. Right. The pressures of life. Uh, when we have to find ourselves at a very crossroads. Mm. Do you allow the Holy Spirit uh, to have full sway? Are you yielding to the direction and the unction of the Spirit of God? Mm -hmm. But not only that, uh, we must depend on the Spirit for help right. to live a God-pleasing life. Amen. We must anticipate, anticipate the effects of uh, the Spirit uh, in our lives. Now, I'm not trying to say, I'm not boiling this down to some subjective, you know, I felt something. I know the Holy Ghost. Whatever you felt, it may be, you may need to take some pepto bismol. I don't know. <laughs> you know, we gonna blame stuff on the snow. Make sure that whatever you think you felt, it matches and harmonizes with the Word of God. Amen. Amen. Yeah, yeah. What well, God told me, this, and God gave me this insight, this revelation. Yeah, yeah, right. You better be make sure you you lining up with the Word. Amen. And and with all that revelation and prophecy, how how is it now lining up with your life? In terms of your commitment to God, in terms of your allegiance to God, your submission uh, in humble obedience to God, that becomes your litmus test. That's right. mm -hmm. Not because you stayed up too late and watched TV and you dreamed about the commercial that was on and you thought it was God talking to you and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Lord Jesus. <laughs> Contrast to walking by the Spirit. In other words, this is not a subjective feeling. It's an objective understanding of the Word of God. Amen. And then your personal endeavoring to make sure that your life is lining up with His Word. And His Word, even in times of trial, in times of conflict, in times of, of uncertainty, the Word of God will guide you. Amen. That's why I need to see more of you in Bible class. So we can know how to rightfully divide the Word. You know, something come up in your life and you go to a passage and you say, oh, it says this, but what did it mean that? It said this, but it didn't mean that over there. Mm -hmm. I'm just simply saying, we're talking about how do I harvest the fruit of the Spirit. Mm -hmm. You see, the apostle specifies that there's some things, there's a war. There's a war that's going on Amen. between the Spirit and, and, and the flesh. Amen. Notice, let me give you a couple of passages. Notice uh, in Numbers 15. Numbers 15, if you've got a microphone, phone, brother, Numbers 15. And, and look at verse 37 through 40. Numbers uh, 15, verse 37 uh, through 40. And then somebody else get Jeremiah 10 and 23. Now, these two passages will help us to understand uh, this contrast. Numbers 15, 37 through 40 says what? 
Again, the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, uh -huh. Speak to the children of Israel. Speak to the children of Israel. Tell them to make tassels on the corners of their garments throughout their generation. Make tassels on their garments. Go ahead. And to put a blue thread in the tassels of the corners. Uh -huh. And you shall have the tassels that you may look upon it and remember all the commandments of the Lord uh -huh. and so, do them. In other words, uh, these tassels were a reminder of all the commandments of the Lord. Sometimes we need reminders so we don't slip and get too comfortable in doing our thing that we forget to walk and to live and to obey the commandments of the Lord. Amen. And so uh, we uh, are to save God against becoming uh, spiritually callous, to become spiritually dull and unaware, and then we forget the commandments of the Lord. Okay. Is that right? Now Jeremiah says what? 1023. Jeremiah chapter, well, why are you getting Jeremiah 1023? Proverbs 14 and 12 says what? He said there is a way that seems right. A way that seems right. It may feel right. right, right. It seems right to a man. Right, right. But the end thereof are the ways of death. Mm -hmm. So therefore, it's not about your subjective feeling. It has to be what thus says the Lord. You have that passage ahead to read. Oh Lord. Oh Lord. I know that the way of man is not in himself. Not in himself. It is not in man that walketh to direct his steps. You can't direct your own steps. That's why we in a mess we in now. Amen. Because we've been trying to do it our way. You know, I, I tried it my way, but guess what? My way didn't work. <laughs> it's time to give it to the Lord. He's the one who will understand. He said, I've been there. I've created the path for you to walk over. But it's a constant struggle. It's a constant uh, war because we find ourselves wanting to do His will our way. Galatians then does not emphasize what we are free to do, but what we are free from. Understand, we have been free from law. We have been free from sin. We've been free from death, but we are not free to live as we please. That's true. Amen. 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 You have freedom to obey God. You have freedom to do the will of God. No, no, this is not license. License is for lawlessness. Right. Not only is it a privilege and responsibility of the Christian uh, liberty, but also uh, it brings us to that point that we have to uh, grapple with. And that is, we have to examine uh, the flesh-led man in order to appreciate the spirit-led man. Amen. Right? Amen. Now, it's interesting to note that the flesh is man's sinful nature. True. See, we are earthly. See, when we were created, we were created about a dozen years. That's true. So we're earthly. But see, now God breathed into us the breath of life. Amen. That's the Spirit of God. But see, there's a tug of war between the earthly and the spiritual. You feel me? Yeah. And so, we, and just because you came up out of the baptistry, does not make you uh, immune from the flesh. Right. You see, the old man had been mortified, had been crucified, right? Right. But you know there's something called a resurrection. <laughs> Sometimes I find you there, I, I'm walking down the street, and I, I look in the cemetery, and I see brothers and so and so digging up them old bones of past behavior. Right. Still longing uh, and, and lusting after the flesh. Now we all are in this thing together. And yeah. we all struggle That's right. with sin. That's right. How many of us don't struggle with sin? Okay. Because the one, see that's the thing. See, see Brother Merriweather has some things that he struggles with. Mm -hmm. Woe to Brother Merriweather when, if he gets to a point where he doesn't struggle with it. That's right. Right, right, right. See, sometimes we don't struggle with anything anymore because we'll become as the Bible says, see it with the hot eyes. And we've grown callous mm. to certain things. Mm. It used to be a time where I would make a, I would sin a, a certain sin, and it would break my heart. Right, right, right. And now I've gotten so comfortable with disobeying God. Mm. That I just do that, and I don't give it a second thought. Mm. So the fact that one does not struggle with this sin nature, 
helps us to understand that perhaps we have kind of capitulated, given in to the sinful nature. Right. And so uh, the apostle is helping us to understand that this uh, flesh led man is living a life of carnality. It is carnal. It's governed by the fleshly desires. And such a person does not accept the thing of the spirit. See, you know, you when you you can tell when you're starting to move when there's certain things that you know to do. You know it in harmony with the will of God. And then you begin to lose a taste for doing those kind of things. That's right. Amen. And you begin to first of all explain away why you don't do what you know that God knows. That you know that you ought to do. Amen. Amen. And we begin to justify and explain away. But then after that, we get to another phase where we don't even think about it anymore. That's right. It's easy for us to just not do what we're supposed to do. And it's easier for us to do what we're not supposed to do. True. Amen. But as long as we are struggling, as long as we're wrestling with that, you know, there is hope for us. Because God said, I'll give you help. Amen. You see, such a person uh, does not accept the things of God. And they are the evidence of a shipwrecked life. That's why I noticed in the passage. Let's look at verse 19 and 21. In, in verse 19 uh, and, and 21, it says, Now the works of the flesh are manifest. In other words, they're evident, which are these. And then he begins to enumerate a whole lot of stuff. Stuff that we're aware of. We've heard these words before. We kind of understand what he's talking about. So I don't want to really turn this into a, you know, word definition kind of time. But I think it does merit us mentioning some things. I want to categorize this. Notice he begins talking about self. Self-defilement. That's right. See, sometimes we sin, sin that are sins against the body. Right, right. We sin against ourselves. We defile ourselves. Notice he begins to number, he says, uh, uh, adultery. Uh, he talks about, uh, let, me, let, me, let me read it, fornication, uncleanness, uncleanliness, and lasciviousness. Notice he begins to talk about uh, this adultery. Now we understand adultery uh, is uh, defiling the marriage bed, right? You have a, a covenant that you ventured into with your spouse, and then as soon as your spouse is turning their back, you are now uh, violating uh, that covenant. You have defiled uh, that covenant between the husband and wife. See, uh, it, it really it boils down to immorality. Uh, there's a word here for fornication. It's the word poinia. That's the word for part of uh, fornication. That's where we get the English word pornography. And, and, and really, uh, this immorality is, uh, it refers to all illicit sexual activity. That's right. Where we can begin to isolate adultery as sexual uh, infidelity between the husband and wife. This is just flat out, flat out illicit sexual activity. It can be husband and wife, it could be anybody right. who's not married. That's right. Okay? And then you talk about impurity or uncleanliness. Uncleanliness. Now, the thing about this uncleanliness is that kind of uncleanliness that prevents our approach to God. See, we can't just, you know, just strut in the presence of God, you know, with all of our sins. In the Old Testament, they had to go through, they had to go through washings and, and they had to go through certain things before they could even uh, come into the presence of God. And so, do you not know that when we begin to live and practice a life of, of uncleanness, uncleanliness, we, it, 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 it hinders the very approach uh, to God. Amen. Sensuality as an unrestrained uh, indulgence. Sometimes uh, we can get so beside ourselves that we don't even care who's looking. Right, right. We don't even care about God. Right. It's an unrestrained and unashamed indulgence. Indulgence in anything. Hmm. Folks go to a party, try to get women drunk, take them in the room, <laughs> Try to uh -oh. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. And he said, I, I, I don't remember that, but I never, I never blacked out. Uh -oh. <laughs> I, 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 I don't remember that. 
It might certainly be a change to another direction. <laughs> what a shame. And, and if that was bad enough, it's even worse that we condone and put That's up true. with and tolerate That's true. that kind of stuff. That's very true. You know, I, uh, don't, get, don't get it twisted now. I think that sometimes, um, first of all, I, I, I embrace the Me Too movement. And, and, and that doesn't mean that sometimes there could be a spiteful woman who might do some things that are not right. Of course, that's possible. That's a possibility. That's a possibility. But we have to understand that if uh, a woman has been violated, that's right. she needs to. We need to. She needs to be able to speak. Amen. We don't want to do a, 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 the gag rule that you can't even speak. Right. We'll hear you, but we're not going to believe you. We're going to believe you, but I don't believe you. Mm -hmm. <sighs> Maybe that's my key to, to move on. In my sermon, I'm going to get on this <laughs> I'm right there. Thank you, Holy Spirit. <laughs> for, for telling the, for not everybody here to put home back right <laughs> Pray God for kids. <laughs> Spiritual. Defilement. Notice the next category. He talks about idolatry. Mm -hmm. He talks about the sin of, of worshiping man, or made man-made images. Uh, the, the sin of putting other things before God. That's idolatry. Right. That's a spiritual defilement. He talks about sorcery. Yeah. Uh, now, this is interesting <laughs> because the word uh, for sorcery is pharmakia. Which is the same word from which we get the English word pharmacy. Uh huh. In other words, uh, sorcery was always engaged in the practice of witchcraft and uh, magic, and, and there were these special potions and, and all that kind of thing, and, and, and all of those things they were doing. Some of the stuff was supposed to make you love somebody, and then something else was supposed to hate, make you hate somebody. And then all these mind altering drugs, and right now we have a, a drug opioid epidemic. Right. And pharmacies is going plumb wide. That's right. It's all about the money. Amen. But thing, this whole thing was, it's a dark art, it's sorcery. It's all this stuff that we get to all these mind altering things. Yeah. Right. And you, I, I watch TV at night sometime, and commercial come on, they talk about this product, this product. And then they say, this may cause death, it may cause bladders. <laughs> <laughs> But they get this little something out of your singing in. Yeah, I keep a little Give me a singing in fact. You know. Go ahead and try it. I'm just saying. You know, ask your doctor if it's right for you. <laughs> yes. And then there is social defilement. Uh, the sin that relates to human relationships. The human relationships can be severed because of enmity and hateful attitudes right. uh, that result in strife and bitter conflicts and jealousy and all that kind of stuff. Right. See, I don't, uh, you know, I was fine with what I had on until I saw what you had on. Yeah. And then I don't like what I have on because I want what you had on. <laughs> well, you think about it at first. See, sometimes you can get jealous of other people. It's a form of anger and bitter resentment because of coveting for oneself what belongs to another, even if that other person's wife. You see, the product of the corrupt and depraved nature, most of them are condemned by the light of nature itself. You may not have a problem stealing something from me, but if somebody steals something from you, you got a problem. That's why you know that stealing is wrong. Right. And it's, it's the light of day that not expose it, the scriptures does. Mm -hmm. And so, let me just say this. I, I think I don't want to confuse anybody, I want to make sure. Because uh, our struggle with the flesh is fueled by, as I said earlier, an uncertainty of our salvation. Now, I think Brother Merriweather would be wise at this time if I kind of you know, made a statement regarding saving faith. What is saving faith? 
when I think there's a twofold nature of saving faith. No, it's not all about just getting persons wet. The twofold nature of saving faith is number one, it is believing in Jesus. Right. It's also trusting in Jesus, which culminates in hoping in Jesus. Mm -hmm. Now, let me just kind of deal with that for just a second. Remember when uh, Jarius, Brother McIntosh, preached a lesson on he Jarius the other day. I appreciate the message. Uh, but remember Jarius, he came to Jesus mm -hmm. because his daughter was sick to point of death. Mm -hmm. You see, it took a certain kind of faith to make him break all protocols. So he was a, a big wig in the synagogue. Mm -hmm. So he had to break protocol. He had to deal with all the potential ostracization and, and alienation that will result from him even coming to Jesus. You feel what I mean? Yeah. So it took a certain believing that Jesus would be able to do what he could do. But notice, it had to graduate. See, faith is more than simply a mental ascent. Mm -hmm. I simply believe that there's a God up there somewhere. Right, 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 right. God didn't ask him to come to my heart and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Okay? Uh, notice, uh, it drove him to come to Jesus mm -hmm. and plead with Jesus to come because that belief had to morph itself into a, a trust. Come on with me. I trust that if you can do, if you would do to my daughter what you did to that woman, my daughter would be okay. Mm -hmm. But then when word came that his daughter was dead, all that trust was at the point of dissipation That's right. and fading away. That's right. And then Jesus said, just believe. Yeah. Yeah. Just keep on believing. Yeah. And notice what happened. His belief had moved to trust, but now it manifested itself in a hope. Yeah. A hope against all odds. Mm -hmm. A hope that, you know, when everything says no, Jesus can still say yes. Amen. He, so, so, so saving faith is believing, yes, he is the Son of God. But also trusting in him to keep his promise to do what he said he would do. And I have a hope of eternal life now because of the finished work of Jesus. Amen. Saving faith is uh, hoping and trusting and believing in him. Amen. That's not all. In as much as that's one facet of saving faith, there's another side of saving faith. And that is obeying. Amen. Amen. The Word of God is designed to bring us to the obedience of faith. Amen. See, if you don't comply with uh, the prerequisites, if you don't ask to ask to ask to two, when Peter uh, preached that inspiring message to help everybody to understand that God had made that Jesus who they had crucified, the Lord and Christ, they were so overwhelmed with the reality of their sin, they interrupted the sermon, and me and brother, what shall we do? He said, repent and be that child. And every one of you, in the name of Jesus, for the forgiveness of your sins, you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Those who complied were saved, and those who did not comply. In other words, saving faith is more than simply believing. It's more than uh, trusting and hoping. It has to eventuate in obeying. You've got to obey the gospel. Right. You've got to uh, hear the word and believe it. Amen. Trust in Jesus uh, to be the one who's able to, to bring you justification. And then submit Amen. by being buried in the watery grave and baptism for the forgiveness of your sin. Amen. Yes. The twofold nature of saving faith. Amen. I just thought it was necessary to say that before I moved on. Because I finally I want to get to the point uh, that we uh, broached in the reading of the word, which is in chapter 5, verse 22 through 26. We want to talk about the spirit-led man, and the lesson will be yours. Notice, quickly, if you will, that the fruit of the spirit, notice, at first, he talks about the, the works or the deeds of the flesh are manifest. In other words, they're evident. You can see uh, by watching a person's life, 
That's or whether true. they be led by the flesh. That's true. Mm -hmm. Ah, but it's a little bit more subtle uh, when it gets to the spirit nature. Mm -hmm. And for that, let us converge on verse 22. He said, but the fruit of the spirit. Notice he uses the word fruit. He said, but the fruit, not the deeds, but the fruit. See, the word fruit uh, suggests growth. Mm -hmm. Fruit suggests a process. Mm -hmm. Remember in, in, in Matthew chapter 7, uh, we're talking about you know, entering to the, the straight and narrow gate. You know what I'm in the verse number 15 of chapter 7 in the book of Matthew, he says, he said, beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. Remember that? Mm -hmm. And he said, and you shall know them by their fruit. You shall know them by what they produce. Mm -hmm. And so now, the Apostle Paul says, the fruit of the Spirit. You can know the work of the Holy Spirit in your life by what it is producing in your life. Amen. And sometimes that's a gradual process. Mm -hmm. Because you not uh, you are who you are today, but that does not mean you're going to be the same person tomorrow. That's true. Right. If you allow the Spirit of God to have rule and reign in your life. The fruit of the Spirit. It suggests growth. It suggests maturity. Maturity. That is not seen instantly, but rather through the process of time and pressure will true Christian virtues be revealed. Now let's look at these virtues for just a moment. Notice he says love. Right? He says love. Now love, of course we know that's what makes the world go around, right? <laughs> right? He says love. Now love is the supreme virtue of Christian living. How many of us love God? Amen. And that's the most important thing that we do is love our vision statement. Glorify God. Love God. As a matter of fact, over in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, he said, if I say that, I, if I speak with the tongue of men and angels and have not charity, I'm a, I'm a, 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 a clean, gong, and tickling symbol. And James Brown would say, you're talking loud and saying nothing. <laughs> love has to be the supreme virtue of Christian living, a personal choice of willingness, uh, self-giving service is not an option, but it's a command. Love God with all your heart, mind, and strength. But then he said in the second commandment, it's like it's a verse, love your neighbor as yourself. Love is the first thing. But then he says joy. Now joy is a feeling of, I'm going to use this word, happiness. A deep abiding sense of uh, contentment that is based on spiritual reality. It's a deep sense of well-being resulting from knowing that all is well with me. Right. If you have trusted in Jesus for your salvation, it doesn't matter how turbulent uh, your circumstances are. You can still have joy. Why? Because you have a blessed assurance that Jesus has got your back. And when Jesus has got your back, guess what? Your back, your back is got. So you have joy, even when everyone seems to fall apart and lose it. And then he says, peace. Now last week we talked about how Jesus quieted the sun, right? But this peace, this tranquility, is a tranquility uh, that stems from knowing uh, the Savior relationship. Just like joy, it has no relationship to circumstances. Just like joy. It has no relationship to circumstances. See, happiness is when your good feeling is based on external circumstances. Right. Someone says hello to you, and they smile at you today. Somebody says you're cute. They like your outfit, and you all fine. But let somebody come up to you and say something that you don't like. <laughs> <laughs> you, you ever seen those uh, commercial, uh, not a commercial, but for me like this? <laughs> yeah, that's something. Turn around like you on a dad. But joy and peace in an inner tranquility. Right. They can't take that away from you. But they didn't give it to you. Right. It's all based on your relationship with Jesus. Amen. Jesus gives us peace. Jesus gives us joy. Amen. He gives us tranquility. And no man, Amen. not even the devil himself, can't take it 
take it away. Amen. Don't you forfeit. Amen. But they can't take it away. Amen. And patience. Now this is getting practical. It's getting scary now. Uh-huh. I got peace. I got love. I got joy. But do you have patience? <laughs> do you have tolerance? Do you have long suffering? That endure the injuries inflicted by others. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Patience. To be able to suffer long and to put up with and bear with the uh, idiosyncrasies and, and all that of others. And even when you go through circumstances that we define as persecution, can you endure it with patience? Right. Yeah, there'll be some people on your job <laughs> who will try to trip you up and, and knock you off your game. But if you, are, if you uh, understand who you are and whose you are, you can tolerate <coughs> that foolishness and endure to the end. Right. And kindness. And, and this is good. I, I like kindness because kindness talks about a, a, a tender concern for others. Sometimes we might not be able to meet everybody's needs, but we can still be kind. That's true. Is that right? Brother Perry wasn't been working on this. I'm trying to be kind. I know the work in progress. But now I understand a little bit more fully uh, the principle that you can draw more with honey than with, what is it? With vinegar. You gotta be kind. You have to, to have that kind of uh, disposition of gentleness. And notice how in 1 Thessalonians, uh, the Apostle Paul says, we treated you like a mother, with all gentleness. I would have given, we would have given our own body, our own, our own heart, our own eyes for you. Nurturing, kindness, and goodness, that moral and spiritual excellence uh, that is shown by a sweet, uh, uh, sweetness and an active kindness. Oh, he says also faithfulness. What does it mean to have faithfulness? What is loyalty? How many of you are loyal? Mm -hmm. now, I'm not talking about just being loyal to the people who are loyal to you. Loyal to the purposes of God. Mm -hmm. See, when you are loyal to the purposes of God, you can show loyalty to others who are not even loyal to you. That's right. true. How do you deal with that? Loyalty and trustworthiness. That is something that has to be produced by the Spirit because that's not within us to do that. We are taught to like people who like us. Sure. I invite you to dinner because I know you're going to invite me to dinner too. Right, right. Mm -hmm. But how can you have that kind of disposition of meekness, which includes the idea of judgment, but it's much deeper than that. Uh, but it refers to a tamed strength. We call it power under control. I call it power under God's control. And James said, James said you can take a heart and put a bit in his mouth and you can lead him everywhere you want to go. He becomes gentle. He becomes tamed. How many of us are still untamed in certain areas of our lives? Right, right, right. The fruit of the Spirit produces right. this kind of thing. And self-control. In other words, the ability to restrain your passions and your appetites. Sometimes we can't constrain our passions. Sometimes we can't constrain our appetites. Sometimes we can't constrain those old habits uh, that we still have and we Fight against it before, you know it though, we let our guard down and the Lord have it to stay, get the best of us. Mm -hmm. But these things that we just enumerated, if we begin to prayerfully consider these things and have the boldness to attempt to practice these things, it will become evident. It's going to manifest itself Amen. in a spirit like led man. Right. The message of the gospel, the message of the gospel. Uh, is that we, uh, if we by faith practice walking by the Spirit, we can have the confidence of our salvation that will motivate us to a greater life of holiness, to a higher attainment of spiritual insight and development. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. If you're here today, and, and you, you want to be more in tune to God. You want to live a life uh, that pleases God. 
In other words, if you have recognized that there are certain areas in your life that have not been brought under subjection to the will of God, we have to admit that. And then say, God, I bring it all to you. I give myself to you. I give my, my hopes and my desires, my goals and aspirations. I give it all to you. But that's, that's, that's not all. I'm also giving my weaknesses to you. I'm giving my brokenness to you. I'm giving my fears and my sins and, and all of that. I lay it at the foot of the cross. I give it to you today. That you may take me in my brokenness and me and me back together. I realize that you are the potter and I'm merely the clay. Amen. Shape me and make me Mold me into what you want me to be. Amen. And I will yield myself to the pressure of your making. If you're not a Christian and you need to be baptized for the forgiveness of your sin, understand that Jesus died for you. He was buried and he rose again the third day. And as we embrace by faith the finished work of Jesus on Calvary, we die to our sins. We, we, we repent of our sins. Okay? We we turn from our sins, turn to him, and we say we are going to send him the sufficient sacrifice. I confess to the Lord, I'm willing to be buried in the water of the river baptism. And just as he was buried in the tomb and rose again the third day, we too can rise to walk in the newness of life. Think about that together. We stand and sing a song of encouragement. We invite you to respond. Sure.